Kevin, we know you do documentary workshops. You just finished one mm -hmm. at the writer's store. What are some of the questions that you're most frequently asked during these uh, interactive uh, documentary workshops? Well, uh, probably the number one question is how do you fund a documentary? And that's always the most difficult aspect of it. Um, I found that uh, they're very interested in doing a documentary, obviously at a lower price point, if they're, especially if they're just starting. So we've developed a, um, a budget where I can show people how for five or ten thousand dollars a micro budget, including buying the equipment, you can actually go out and make a documentary. Now that's if you can do a lot of the roles yourself. So if you can teach yourself how to be the cameraman and the sound person or the editor or do the color grading or the scoring. If, if you're a one-man band, you can certainly do it for very little money if you're doing a documentary on your neighbor or somebody that's, that you know that's interesting and you don't have a lot of travel and a lot of other crew positions. So I get asked a lot about budget and then I get asked a lot about, well, how do you actually start? And, and we, go, we take them through the entire process. You have to have a, a topic that interests you that will sustain your interest for six months or six weeks or four years, you know, in the case of searching for Sugar Man. Uh, you, you need something that really you can stay with for a long time because these things sometimes the funding comes in a little little pieces and um, it can be a long process. So I'm asked a lot about funding, about how you start, and just basically about the nuts and bolts of how do you construct, how do you build this documentary. Speaking of uh, subjects for your documentary, um, is there some place that's sort of like the Craigslist for documentarians when it comes to finding subjects? Or is it just a matter of observation? People that do documentaries are just sort of voyeurs and they find interesting... Uh, yeah, people. no, it's just, it's life, really. I mean, it's just where what you see that interests you. Um, you know, when I was starting uh, uh, the movie I did called Border War, it was... Uh, a time in Los Angeles and it's still going on when we started to see a bunch of activity on the border with cartels with human smugglers and drug smugglers and um, when I was trying to fund the film in Washington DC they weren't seeing the same level of, of uh, concern and I was a little bit ahead of the curve on that and they were saying I don't, we don't see any border war what's what are you talking about there's nothing going on on the border so it's but it's really observing around you what interests you what will again what will sustain you and so everything, just walking down the street and seeing, are you into cars? Are you into vintage planes? Are you into, uh, you know, an obscure musician like Sixto Rodriguez for Sugar Man that uh, has an amazing story, a, a comeback story? Um, so it's just anything in life that you think uh, is a story that you want people to, to know and, and that you could communicate to people and maybe bring a better understanding to a topic, a cause, a historical event that you want to revisit like Errol Morris did with the fog of war anything that piques your interest in that, that you want to tell the story about how has documentary filmmaking evolved you look at something like gray gardens which was beautiful in its own right but then you see <clears> something <throat> like searching for sugar man and it seems like filmmaking nowadays is so much faster the editing is just quicker how have we changed as an audience so that uh, filmmaking is what it is in terms of this fast cutting. Well, it's, it, it, is, it reflects the same kind of a attention span that all forms of filmmaking, commercial making, television, all of that has become faster. So Grey Gardens is going to look slow. Um, so yes, everything is faster. If you look at Grey Gardens, um, it is of a different era and it's also cinema verite, which is supposedly a, fl like a fly on the wall style of filmmaking. Some would argue that you're never a fly on the wall. The minute you have a cameraman in a room, you're influencing the events. But um, we, we talk about different styles of documentaries in, in the class, and cinema verite is certainly a, 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 one of the earlier forms of documentary filmmaking where you're just observing an event. Searching for Sugar Man is something much, what's much more constructed, or uh, you're adding visual and uh, oral textures to it. You're using music in a very dramatic way. You're using sound effects in a very dramatic way. Uh, graphics, animation. Uh, Errol Morris does the same thing with his montages. You're actually constructing uh, uh, scenarios to support your story that are completely completely created by the filmmaker. Uh, there's, a se there's several sequences in The Fog of War. Errol, Errol Morris takes what normally would have been just a a picture of a B-29 over Tokyo. 
but because he likes to construct his documentaries, he'll cut the plane out, he'll make the props spin around, and he'll, he'll just do things that kind of take you to a different place, so you're observing it in a different way. It's more of an entertainment style, but it's also more of a, you're kind of looking at it in a different way than, a, than perhaps a documentary you would see on BBC about World War II. So there are different styles. The cutting is faster today, no doubt about it. And um, uh, the other documentaries we talk about, you know, the, so there was a cinema, ver cinema verite, which is observational. Then there's something that might be called participatory, which is the kind of filmmaking that Michael Moore does, or Morgan Spurlock, where the filmmaker doesn't pretend that he's a fly on the wall. In fact, it's the exact opposite. He, they become part of the action. They, they're a character in their own movie. Uh, and then there's the, the more uh, routine or uh, documentary we see on television is like Frontline. And that's kind of an expository style where you have the voice of God narrator t taking you down the path. Ken Burns does that as well. So um, we look at the different styles of documentaries and we also look on, on, in every one of those forms, things are faster, things do move quicker. And yet sometimes you can, you can play against that and slow it down to effect. So there's always a context for the, the, you know, the way you're, you're shooting and cutting a documentary. Do you think a documentary such as Crumb would have the same appeal as it did back in the 90s as it does now? Knowing that, that things have changed, anybody can have access to iMovie, 10 year olds are teaching people on YouTube how to edit. Crumb was a brilliant documentary. I wouldn't change one frame of Crumb if I released it today. It's, it, the thing about any of these documentaries is sto it's about storytelling. I don't care how fast you cut or how you shoot it or what you shoot it on. Um, Crumb was beautifully made had told a great story, was well constructed, and that's, that's another thing that people ask in, in these classes is, and that they need to understand is that the essence of any of this is storytelling. It's, it's not about, cut, you know, the, all the other stuff is great and, and will have an impact on the film, but you have to be telling a compelling story. Crumb had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Absolutely fascinating characters, great lead character, so, you know, I wouldn't change one bit of crumb, and I think it would be just as successful. And obviously, he went on to do feature films. He, he had the chops, he had the storytelling chops to go on and do feature films. That being said, Kevin, what is a three-act structure for a documentary film? Isn't that manipulating reality in some sense? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, all storytelling, you know, this was a, uh, a lesson that uh, I was taught one time, I was in a meeting with Peter Goober and I was pitching a show and I think he was preparing his book, Tell to Win, which is about what he calls the emotional transportation business. And he's, his claim, and I think it's true, is that all entertainment, whether it's a documentary or a commercial or a feature film, dramatic film, uh, the audience expects to be taken from one point when they walk in the theater or turn on the TV to another place and to a final place at the end. They want to go on a ride somewhere. And so all filmmakers, I think, owe it to their audience to tell some kind of story that has a beginning, middle, and an end. So whether you construct it consciously or not, you just, you, when you think about it, all stories, whatever you do, the story of you coming over here to talk to me today, I mean, that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's just the way we do things. So I don't think you're constructing anything. If, if you're following a character and you meet them and you're, you're doing this film for some reason, you find an interesting character and here's where they're at. Well, if you follow them for any length of time, you're going to see their life change and maybe, maybe they're trying to get something when you meet them. And that's why you're interested in them, interested in, them in the beginning. So in, in Act 2, they're going to be trying to get that object. And perhaps at the end of 2, yes or no, you know, they, they'll either get it or they'll come up against something that they might not be able to surmount. In Act 3, you're going to see whether they get it or not. In, um, in Border War, I had five main characters, and each of, them, I can, each of them had three acts. And this was just by being around them for a certain amount of time. There was a young woman I followed. She had lost her husband, who was a L.A. County deputy sheriff. He had pulled over a man on the freeway. The man shot him and killed him. He was an illegal immigrant, and he fled back to Mexico. So this young woman, that's act one for her. Act two is she's trying to find this man. And I caught up with her during act two. And during the course of six months, I see her try every avenue, including writing to the President of the United States and meeting with him, to try to bring this guy back from Mexico to get justice for her family and for her husband. Act three, and it just 
a stroke of a fortune, during our filming um, time, they actually found the guy in Mexico and brought him back. So that was her act three, and completely un unconstructed by me, but something that fits in that three act structure. And, and I was able to find those three acts, even in very, very small ways for these other characters. You might not think they were three acts, but they're actually three acts. Somebody else was a border agent who, in the beginning, I see him do his job, Lou Mejeda. Uh, the crisis at the end of Act Two is he actually gets assaulted by a vehicle. That's a ve vehicular assault on a federal agent by a, a coyote, a human smuggler. And Act Three, they find out who the guy is. So that was another three act arc. So you'll find these things in life as you follow characters around and create documentaries. You'll find your act structures. And whether and in, and in constructed or documentaries, in ones where you actually construct, yes, you actually will make them. In the fog of war again, Errol Morris is ask, asking Robert McNamara to tell the story, but M Morris knows when he's telling the story that there is a beginning and a middle and an end, and McNamara knows it too when he tells the story of his involvement with the Vietnam War. So, you know, beginning his involvement, what happened during the war, and what he thinks about it now. That's three acts. So I think you could find them, surprisingly, in almost any scenario. Kevin, let's say someone knows what their, quote, subject is. Day one of shooting, what are they doing? What are some of the things that they're doing? They're walking into this person's environment. How are they capturing the mood of this person's place, et cetera? Well, hopefully, you know, you've established some sort of relationship going in, and you've talked to them either in person or on the phone, and you've had a number of emails, and you you know, to get them to say, yes, I'll let you be a part of my life and film me for any, you know, whatever amount of time. But you, you have to know you're going to be doing probably a lot of interviews, you know, um, maybe. But the, the first one, if you want to get something in, in the can, so to speak, and get a, a good hour in the, in, in the can, you're going to go over and set a nice, you know, scene, make them comfortable. Kind of, uh, you've kind of talked about what kind of questions you're going to ask them. You don't need to show them anything. Sometimes if they ask for a list of questions, if I'm doing a television show, I'll generally not want to do that, but if, if they insist, I'll, I'll give them some sample questions. That's not a big, a big thing. Um, g make them comfortable and just have a conversation with them. You know, um, let them know that um, we can start and stop and do this again. You know, if they don't like their answer or they want to, re uh, you know, you know, amend something. Um, so you're going to get, you know, hopefully you can get, you know, s just to start the ball rolling, get a nice interview for an hour or so. Don't wear them out. Don't do three hours. Just get an hour and get some b-roll around their house maybe going down uh, to what they're doing that's maybe related or not even related to the topic you're talking about but you're trying to create a character you're trying to create a person so you want to see them living you want to see them doing their things so even if this is a show about a vietnam veteran or something you know his family's part of his life possibly so you're going to show the family you're going to get to know them if, if they're part of the documentary you're just trying to you know gather all the materials that are really in their world their environment, their house, their work, their friends, if they're applicable. So you're just trying to get, because these are building blocks you need, because you need a lot of them. You're going to need, you know, uh, depending on what the show is, you might need, you know, a lot of personal stills. You might need archival material. We can get to that. You know, it's a whole different topic. But you just really want to gain their trust and um, begin this process, because you're probably going to want to go back several times as they go through their life or chase this dream or whatever you're, you're filming when you're in the topic of your documentary, you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna go back and catch up with these people. In terms of uh, border war, which, you, which we mentioned before, I would periodically visit the widow of the sh deputy sheriff, see where she is, watch her make the phone calls to her congressman and senator and saying, please, let's try to get this guy back from Mexico. We know where he's hiding. They won't extradite him. We've talked to the president. I've written letters. I see her writing letters. So, you know, you get your B-roll. You're gathering all of the elements you need to create this story because you're not going to want to just show a talking head for 90 minutes. You, wanna, you need coverage. You need to see them doing things. You need archival photos. And you need them, you know, just making it visually uh, interesting to the audience so you, you, know, so you have that, that coverage. So that's just one part of building this 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 building that's going to twist and turn as you the more material you gather so you know i always tell my students that i'll make an outline at the beginning but i'm you have to be completely open to it twisting and turning because the more interviews you get in the more 
oh, you'll, you'll learn things, you find out things. Maybe you don't need that extra interview. Maybe this takes the story in a whole new direction, so you need to get an extra interview. So it's like building a building, but where the blueprint is always changing, and it should change, and you should react to it. You, know, you don't want to be in a box and think, this is exactly how my documentary is going to look, and then have all these things come in that make it better and, and say, no, I can't put that in because that wasn't in my outline. No, you want to be free and make this a sculpture and build it as it goes. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a the Alex Gibney movie out on, the, on Julian Assange now that I believe at some point in filming, you know, uh, Assange does not cooperate, but at some point the filmmaking team figures out that this guy is very complex and they can either call him a maniac or a genius or whatever, but he's got a, a, a massive ego and, and he's difficult to work with. His people, so that kind of takes it in different, it adds a layer of, of, of context to these characters and the, and the situation. So, you know, you have to be open to the story twisting and turning as you go. And that includes the three-act structure, because if you yeah, and, and the, but the, with the three-act structure, you no, know, I'm not so rigid that I have to say everything is three acts. I might have six acts. I might have, you know, in, in Broken Promises, which was a movie I made about the United Nations on its 60th anniversary. I, I also followed several different characters, and I wanted to tell, uh, I wanted to tell a story of, of, uh, of peacekeepers through people that were affected on the front lines of these missions. So I wanted to get in the, I wanted to go through personal stories. I wanted to find personal stories that would uh, illuminate larger issues like oil for food or the, Srebe the massacre in Srebrenica or the, the genocide in Rwanda. I wanted to find people who were actually there on the ground to tell me their, their view of what happened. So, you know, you're always trying to relate it to personal stories large topics but if you can relate it to personal stories that will help so it's not always sometimes it's not three acts you know in a, in, a, in a conventional dramatic way sometimes it's six acts depending on how many characters you have and perhaps the entire movie is three acts but you you sliced it so that little characters can come in and, and leave and, and they their story can wrap up and it's soon going toward a larger three-act frame on that United Nations movie was here was what it was created to be in 1945, which was the World's Workshop for Peace, largely created by the United States. What happened in Act Two? Lots of good things happened with UNICEF and what have you and feeding the poor, but lots of bad things happened too, with scandals and peacekeeper rape scandals and oil, oil for food again and, and, and these various uh, problems and corruption. So that's Act Two and Act Three is are we just going to burn the building down? No. How do you, how do you try to fix it? How, what are the ideas to try to bring them back to that original ideal of 1945 to be the world's workshop for peace? So those were, within that three-act structure, the larger one, I had multiple, you know, little, tinier acts within that as I follow these characters, you know, as they, as they show us how they've related to these various UN uh, programs. What would a filmmaker need to know about shooting an interview in terms of like setting up their camera let's say they're using a DSLR like the one we're using now what are some of the tips that they should be aware of well you you number one you'll 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 know with a DSLR uh, you're gonna have a beautiful picture because of the large sensor but it, essentially it's still a still camera not a video camera especially when it comes to audio audio is your biggest workaround now you have you have a dual, a dual system, which is like an old 16 millimeter film camera with a Nagra, you know, tape recorder. So you have to sync up the sound in the picture because you can't really, when you use an HDSLR, you're not going to bring the audio straight into the camera, generally speaking, unless you really, you know, it's, it's, you're going to get over modulated audio and you're going to get all kinds of problems. You're going to want to do it separately. So that's a workaround there. The ergonomics on a DSLR are not the same as a shoulder mounted camera, that's just, which is why you see all these incredible rigs they come up with, which are generally speaking almost more expensive than the cameras, you know, by various vendors where you can have shoulder mounts. And it's all about stabilizing it because these, most of these image stabilization lenses are still still camera lenses. They're not the same as a video image stabilized video lens. So, you know, I used to think I was a very good handheld camera person and I'm, you know, for a director, I do, I do some of my own shooting, but just generally B-roll and stuff, I hire, you know, really good DPs and operators. But this, the first time I operated my Canon DSLR was at a rally, the downtown rally, 
uh, immigration rally and I did a lot of stuff in the crowd and I brought it back and it was horrible. It was so jittery and I, I, I couldn't believe I shot it. But the point was, it's not image stabilized the same way as a video camera is. So, you know, get this thing rock solid, be prepared for the sound work around, but you know, you're going to have spectacular images. They're really amazing what you can get out of the uh, HDSLRs now. Going back to finding more about your quote subject, is there sometimes too much to know ahead of time? Can you get all of the good stuff out in one phone call and then once you meet with them in person, they're sort of flat? Yes, yeah, that happens. You want to save, it's generally not so much in the phone call, but when you arrive on location as your crew is setting up or you're setting up and you're starting to talk and maybe they're starting to offer stuff, you don't want them to be talked out. You don't want them to give up too much. You know, see, I've often said, you know, wait, let's, let's save it for the interview because this is really good. I don't want you to feel like you're repeating yourself. I want you to be fresh with it and and spontaneous. So, yeah, you don't you don't want to you don't want to get you know spoil it. You don't want to get too much out. Generally, with the phone call, it's going to be days before, so that's not a problem. But when you arrive, make sure they're fresh and you know don't don't have them waste any any uh, any great nuggets that you might regret not getting. And conversely, what if they're too on? What if they're in actor pitch mode and they're just too large for the camera and they're regurgitating all of their sort of press notes? Just tell them that you're there. You're, you're, you just tell them that you, just to calm down. Look, most people you'll find want to be directed in some way because they're not professionally doing, they're, they're not professional on camera documentary subjects, you know, so they might not know. They'll appreciate a piece of constructive criticism. They'll want you to. Uh, you know, make them look good. They'll want you to uh, bring them down. So they'll, they'll, they'll appreciate that. So you just very nicely say, you know what, let's just have a conversation like we did on the phone and like we did before we drilled the camera. So that's generally not an issue. You're not going to find too many people who are not professional people, um, you know, being too up. I think they'll be, generally, it's the other way around. It's bringing them up to co a conversational level and learning to speak, you know, in, in full sentences and because generally, if, especially if you're off camera, you know, you want somebody to be able to repeat the question and the answer, and that takes a little time. But that's, that's generally more of the problem, is bringing people up to the level of what you wanted rather than bringing them down. And if they're too vague, if they're not answering your question? Again, just be very honest with them and say, um, they're just re-ask in, in a very nice way, just re-ask the question in a way that you'll get at what you need to get at. You kind of, you know, you, you're not going to know everything they're going to tell you, but you're going to know what they might have told you before on the phone. So just remind them, you know, you told me the other day that um, this happened and that happened. Can you tell me that story? And they'll tell you, you know. So if they don't want to, they wouldn't be there if they don't, if they, you know, if they don't want to be there. So if by saying yes, they're generally going to, you know, be very uh, uh, amenable to doing whatever, you know, whatever you need to get that answer out that, that you that you that they told you before. You're not creating anything. You're not asking them to to falsify anything. You're just reminding them that you told me the other day that this happened. Can you tell me that story? That's generally all you need to do. In terms of people that maybe are umming, saying mm, you know, and and hesitating, do you sometimes leave that in because that's just a natural style for them, or people who are too fidgety? You know, I the, with, with fidgety, I'll tell them you're, you're drifting or something, but. With the ums and the ands, if that's how they talk, they talk. You'll clean that up in editing. You know, you don't want to. You don't, you don't want to give them so much. You know, uh, criticism that they're going to freeze up. You know, if that's the way they talk, that's the way they talk, and you'll you'll work with it. And, and again, it might be part of the, the the context of the answer. You know, searching for the answer might be part of that answer itself, where they're hesitant or they're duplicitous or whatever they might be, maybe that's part of the whole thing, so you might want that. But it's, if it's just an um and an and, generally when you go through your edit, you know, you're going to be cleaning up. If you have enough coverage, you're going to be cleaning a lot of that stuff up. Can you tell us the difference between a $10,000 documentary versus a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, two million? Mm -hmm. What do you get at each price point? Well, at, at ten thousand dollars, you're not going to get a lot. You're not. You you can make a documentary for ten thousand dollars, but you'll have to do either a lot of the crew positions yourself, or have people that will you know volunteer their time to do it for you. So you're going to have to ask for a lot of freebies. But you can do a documentary for ten thousand. You can buy that camera that we're shooting on today for you know three three thousand with the lens, uh, thereabouts. And you're going to be able to buy your zoom recorder, and you're going to be able to buy 
you know, a few lights and what have you. And so you can get in business for probably under under five. And then if you're not traveling and you're just shooting, you know, in your area, then it's you can and it's your own gear. You can shoot as many days as you want if you're not hiring crews. So you can do it on ten thousand dollars. But at each price point, if you go next, go up to the hundred thousand dollar documentary. Now you're going to be able to pay people what their normal industry rate is. You know, on a ten thousand dollar documentary, you're not going to bring out a makeup person for between six and eight hundred dollars a day. You just can't do that. You can't buy a full HD crew for thirty five hundred dollars a day rental with sound. So, but at a hundred thousand dollars. You're going to get the full HD crew at their normal rate, about 3,500. That's with sound. That's with lights. That's with if you need a lighting director and his grip, you know, cart. That's 700 bucks or to a thousand dollars. You're going to be able to afford that. You're going to be able to afford a gaffer if you need it, just to make everything look better. You're going to be able to afford uh, not maybe needle drop music that's royalty free from a music library. Now you can bring a composer in, not at the highest end, but for fifteen or seventeen thousand dollars maybe. On a hundred thousand I wouldn't do that. On a two hundred and fifty I would bring in that that level of composer. But so you're just gonna be able to travel a bit if you have interviews across the country you need for your show. You still need to know where to economize. In other words, do you need a hundred thousand dollars you're not flying your DP you know, director of photography to New York. You're, you're getting a local crew. And in some cases, you might have to even hire a local stringer director if it's not a huge interview to do the interview for you. Sometimes you direct it over Skype or what have you if you want to be, you know, if you want to be sure. I've done that many times. So you, you, for $100,000, you'll get the travel, you'll get more crew days, more shoot days. You'll be able to buy some clips, some archival footage. You go up next to go up to 500000 it's more of the same. More prep, more research, more shoot days, more travel. Everybody gets paid industry standards for what they're doing. Um, better music, better graphics, better color grading. So, and on and up. Two million dollars, you can, you can now maybe, if you had a pop song you wanted to buy, very expensive to license music, but you'll have a better original score, you might even buy some, some songs. Again, better, more travel, more prep, Archival footage, I've spent on some films over $100,000 on clips and, and stills, and that's what you're going to get either at a $500 or a $2 million price point. You're going to be able to go to Getty and say, I need you know, 188 stills, and they'll make a deal with you. I need you know, um, 46 minutes of archival footage of this event. You know, I did a movie called Nine Days That Changed the World where Pope John Paul II visits Poland in 1979 and sparks this movement that becomes the Solidarity Movement, which eventually takes down communism in Poland. I needed a lot of archival footage. We found some that the Polish Bishops' Council had shot that was unearthed in a, in a room in Pol at Polish television that had been sitting in cans for 30 years, but I still had to buy other stills and clips. So that adds up, and you know, you're gonna have, a, so at a two million price point, you can have a hundred or $150,000 clip budget or more. So those are the various things that's, it really comes down to prep and shoot days and how you pay your crew and travel and music and graphics and everything that makes your and that makes your film more and more polished. So it's possible to be a one man band but it's not going to get you very far in terms of legitimizing the documentary because just the production value. No, no, it. I wouldn't say that at all. I would say you could make that's the great thing about these cameras and and uh, say, if you buy an HDLSR and you buy a subscription to Adobe the Cloud, now for $49 a month, now you have access to their entire editing suite, their After Effects, Photoshop, you know, Premiere Pro. So you can, and if you teach yourself those skills, uh, you can do all of that. And if you teach yourself how to run the camera, you can do that. Now, the thing that costs nothing is finding the great story. It's always about finding the great story. You know, you can have, what if your neighbor is this old time movie actress that has a great story to tell and she's just sitting in her house waiting for you to come over there and film her? That costs you nothing. So the story costs you, no, if you have access, and access is another thing we could talk about. That's the whole, that's the critical nature. Along with the story structure and knowing how to tell a story, it's access to your subject. Um, in that case, on the $10,000 price point, if you have a story with heart and soul that you've shot, 
you could have made that for five hundred dollars conceivably if you had your camera and you never didn't buy anything and you actually learned all these skills and did it yourself it might take you a year or two to do but you could that could be just as good as any documentary that cost a million dollars it's what's the story what's the human story look at sugar man now that was that's four hundred thousand dollars but he was actually he had it he had the nub of the, that movie for about 80, I guess, before he went and he met with the producer of one of the producers of Bird on, uh, Man on Wire, I think in London. And he showed him just a little bit, and the guy said, This is magnificent. We have to, and he was able to, uh, to complete the funding. But the core of that film was the story. And that was just calling people up. They weren't charging you, I don't believe in that case, in most cases not. They're not charging you to tell them, you know, for, for you to tell their story, that you found their story. That's, so, that's gold. That's the gold that's priceless and it doesn't matter if you're using a, a $3,000 camera or an, uh, an Airflex Alexa. So, you know, it's always about the story and the storytelling skill, really. Kevin, we know that crowdfunding is all the rage. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and other sites that are wonderful. But what if someone does not want to crowdfund? It's not as easy as just posting the campaign. There's a lot of work. It's like mm -hmm. a full-time job. Can you talk about other ways of funding, grants, what have you? Well, I've um, been lucky to find private money f to fund my documentaries, but there are more traditional sources, and that's generally teaming up with either a production company or a network. You know, it's a traditional way you go and you pitch a network, HBO, what have you, and they're going to go into business with you. That's ideally the way you do things. That's not easy either. So these other avenues have come along. Grants, I've never done because you need the patience of Job to do that. That takes forever and, you're, and the money's coming in in very small amounts. It's possible. I have a good friend doing a documentary now on WC Handy and she received money, a grant money, and so she's, you know, she's been filming as she goes along. So it is possible. Um, the crowdfunding is also difficult. I've had three friends who have successfully funded at various price points up from thirty-five thousand up to two hundred thousand dollars, and that's very rare. But it's it's doable on on uh, in um, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, um, and and then there, you know there's there's uh, so there, there's private individuals. That's another f form that I found. Uh, that's also difficult, but it's, it 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 does cut through a lot of the back and forth with grants or networks or what have you. So. It's, that's always the number one question and, and the toughest thing is how do you get the money to make these things? So, you know, it's, it's really going out to the marketplace and finding out what they're going to say, well, what's in it for them? Can they make money off this enterprise? It's, it's, are they going to be able to see the return on their dollar, on their investment? Um, so that's why you consider these things when you're picking your topics. You know, you want to you wanna look at the marketplace and say, is there room in the market for this documentary? Is there, has there been competition on this subject? If so, uh, is there room for one more? If not, is, was there a reason nobody wanted to do this topic? So you're going to look at all of that, you know, as you go into funding. But it's always the most difficult thing. There are new ways to do it. I wouldn't say no to the crowdsourcing because if you have a good pitch and you have a good idea, and you maybe only need funds to either get started or to finish, maybe thirty-five or fifty thousand dollars, that's pretty doable. I had some some friends who needed finishing funds of two hundred, and they raised two ten or so. So it is possible to to do if you have a, an appealing subject. Let's say though you'd like <coughs> to go the route of pitching a network or an individual that would like to invest in a film. <coughs> mm -hmm. What do you need to have in place when you show up? I, I know something like that, they were gonna wanna see complete organization and... Right. In my, in my experience, they, don't want, they wanna see a written pitch but they don't want it to be 40 pages. They want it to be f between five and 10 pages that they can get the idea of your film that quickly. And nowadays, if you can put any kind of pitch reel together, sizzle reel, kind of trailer. I know you haven't shot it yet, supposedly, but maybe you can, maybe for free on your own dime, you can go down to your subject and get an afternoon with them and get them on tape. And if you shoot it with your HDSLR and you, sh and you cut it on your, your cloud editing system, you put it together for very little and you have their stills which you can license. And you, so you put together a little two minute pitch movie along with a five-page pitch, you, you, that's all you need. You, they're going to get it from that. So at least come in with those two things and, and you have a shot. 
and quickly just gaining <coughs> access, you, you know, a wonderful neighbor, someone that works at a shop that's right. frequent? Well, access is, is the key to anything. And, you know, it can be on a small level with somebody that you want to make a documentary about and you have a relationship with, or it can be a larger thing where you have to really uh, take months to gain that access. And on Border War, we were embedded by uh, Secretary Chertoff uh, and, uh, in, uh, at Homeland Security. We were embedded with a group of undercover agents in Nogales, Arizona. And to get that access took months. But what that gave the film was this incredible look at what happens on the border with the constant stream of human and drug smuggling coming over. And without that access, that whole section of the film would have not not have been there. That, that really brought the viewer into the smugglers' tunnels and into the safe houses and across the border to see how it all happened. So, you know, access is everything. The same with m m Broken Promises, my movie on the United Nations. You know, I had to go to the United Nations and sit down with them and convince them that I was going to do a film that was going to be constructively critical of their organization, but constructive and fair, and in fact giving them the last word, which is what we did. And um, But you have to gain trust, and uh, get, by gaining that trust during those meetings with the United Nations, we were given access to film in the entire facility, and I don't recall another documentary, at least before or since, there's been a few feature films, but we had access to film in the General Assembly, and the security council rooms, and, and it's just full access to the, to the premises, which was invaluable and gave the film the look that we were looking, going after. So access, uh, whether it's your neighbor or the United Nations or Department of Homeland Security, access is, is really what's going to make your story. In terms of gaining <coughs> trust, I think I heard John Sayles say about Mate Juan that he had to do, quote, the porch time. He had to, you know, go into the community and talk to people and really make them realize that he was an okay guy, he wasn't there to exploit them. Mm -hmm. So what is porch time with United Nations? I mean, how do you court a relationship like that? Well, it was as simple as, you know, calling them up and finding out what's the protocol for proposing that we can do a film and shoot on the premises. And you find out their protocols and you have to write your letters and then you have to go to New York and you sit down with uh, their team in a room and you have to answer their questions. And it's, the bottom line is they'll check you out and, you know, maybe they think, well, somebody's going to do a film on, on us. I've looked and checked into this team and we like this team and we're going to trust this team to do a fair job. It really comes down to that. So it comes down to meeting with these people and gaining their trust. And, and this was uh, all around an event, a 60th anniversary, so there was going to be some press coverage. They knew it was coming and they knew they had to pick and choose who they would allow to be in, on, in the, on the premises. Turns out that the, our, our film was quite, quite critical, very critical, of the of the organization. But it was always meant to be, uh, you know, a kind of a meditation on how do you make it better, how do you improve it. So they got that from from our conversation, and that's why they allowed us to film there. In terms of gaining trust with some, let's say, an obscure artist, and you <coughs> pass them on the street, and you notice them for months, how would one do that without? sort of exploiting them or is is there a very fine line between that well you it's always about making contact i mean if you, you, you if you want to tell their story they have to trust that that uh, they're going to tell it in a fair fashion they want to have they want to be able to say i do want my story told or not if they don't they don't but you just have to gain you have to establish contact i mean it's it's basically what you it's the whole process of filmmaking is about making connections with people too and telling stories and exposing things to larger groups of people so the whole process is about communicating with people and that begins with communicating with your subject hello can i make a film i'd like to make a film about you and the, and you go from there it's almost like asking someone out on a date so you kind of take that one <laughs> right. that one leap and and right. is that as simple as that hey man me well yeah it, it could be as if you know it depends on your comfort level it could be as simple as sending an email which is fairly safe now like hello i'm a, i'm a, i'm very interested in your story i'm a fan of your work and you know here's here's what i've done in the past um, i mean an example recently errol morris did another film with uh, another former Secretary of Defense, this time Donald Rumsfeld, about the Iraq War. Well, he contacted the Rumsfeld office and, and he just gave them, he said, look, here, I made a film called The Fog of War with McNamara. Take a look at that. You can see if you can trust me or not. Come to Washington, D.C. 
and we'll film and I'll put together a little piece and I'll show it to you. And if you like it, we'll proceed. If not, that's fine. We'll walk our, we'll go our separate ways. I believe that's the way the story went, but that's the way sometimes you have to establish trust. You're not out to burn anybody. You're here to make a film and, 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 and communicate and, and put something out, whether it's critical or not. You know, these people, you want them to cooperate with you. So you want to say, I'm going to, I'm, there's no nothing, no games going on here. Here's what I'm doing. Do you want to be a part of this? And here's you can look into my past and you can trust me or you cannot trust me. That's fine, but I would like to do a film and then you can just go from there. Kevin, what's the best way to handle release forms for your documentary film and then how important is it to actually have those release forms? Well, it's, it's critical to have the release forms. You're not going to have a film without the release forms. You won't get your e and insurance without the release forms. You won't get a release, you won't get a distributor, you won't get anything without them. So you have to have them. Now, there's certain parameters about group shots and events and rallies where you don't have to have crowds signing release forms. But your principal sit-down interviews, you have to get release forms. And I have been meticulous throughout my career of getting release forms. And generally, you want to get them signed before you roll the interview. And then the one time I did not was the lesson that you know, learned. And that was the case where I was interviewing someone who had experienced a, a great loss and it took a long time to get them to the point where they said yes to do the interview and it was, so it was a very much of a kind of a, a, a evolving relationship of trust to get to the point where they would sit down in front of the camera and allow, and allow us into their life and I never really and I always knew I should get that thing signed but it was always I didn't want to break this kind of this mood we were getting in that we could trust each other and we did the interviews and we did the story and it turned out to be much bigger than we ever thought and I finally went back because I, I established such a close relationship with this person that we're posting the film I had all the other releases signed in the normal fashion I do but I had not gotten this one done yet and I went back to get the interview and this person said no they were not going to sign the release and this story was so central to my film that without it the film would have crumbled in that section and so uh, they said, no, I will not sign. The next thing I know, I get a phone call from an attorney saying they want a certain amount of money, which was a considerable amount of money, and which we had to pay and to get the release. And, uh, but it, it makes the film, but the point is, always get that release signed. And you know, you, it's, not, it's not a question of yes or no, you have to have a release. You're not gonna get you know, distributed without a release form. So emails would not be binding in terms of someone agreeing to it, it's. Not I don't even think a verbal on camera release is truly binding. They could later they could say, "I really didn't understand what I was saying yes to." If you have it on paper and they sign it, they understand that release form. So uh, you know, have to be very careful about uh, about release forms. You brought up something interesting, crowd shots. I did something the other day on a subway, and everybody was just staring at the camera, and I'm trying to get my subject. I had to use some of that footage what rights does the public have in terms of what if someone sees that and says no you didn't you didn't get a release from me and I see myself on camera there well that's a little different uh, you know crowd shots there's several sizes of crowd and it's not the Coliseum or it's not a huge rally of some form on the mall in Washington DC that's a crowd shot on a subway that's you if you're being able to pick out faces that's a different dilemma now there are there's a lot of rules in this but you know, as long as you weren't hiding the camera, that's one thing in your favor because they see a camera that could always turn away, so the camera was present. Generally speaking, you know, you, if it's going to be on any kind of broadcast TV, they're going to put up a sign saying, "If you we, we're filming here, you give your consent to be on camera." Because we're so you know that's on a professional level on a network. If you're on a subway, I'd be very careful about that because you, are, if, especially if you're going to be showing faces, backs of faces and your and your and your character fine, but. You know, you can't blame them. They're, they're, you know, they're down. They're doing their thing, and you know, you're you're going to be making money off this image probably if you sell this movie. And they're not consenting. To, they didn't. They were never asked for their consent to be in the shot. So you got to be careful when they when you recognize their face. So it's okay the backs of someone, the likeness of them from far away, but yeah, not exactly as long as they're not recognizable, right. or if there's so many, and it's a public event where the news crews are public and, and your camera's in the open, that's a different thing. You've got, it's a new, more of a news context.